All right. So, um, so my name is Moore Harkle Walter. This is a talk that I was asked to give at Stock um, this year on the Stock Conference. And so this is a slightly longer version of that same talk. And I figured I should just give it at CMU, given that I already gave it at Stock, um, so that other people here can share instead of just giving it elsewhere. So um, this is joint work with my two fantastic students, Isaac Rosoff, who's sitting here, and Zeev Scully, who didn't attend probably because he's seen this too many times. <laughs> and, um, but they're basically the people who did all this work. Okay, I'm just gonna explain it all. And so we're gonna be talking about optimal scheduling for multi-server systems. So when we think about optimal scheduling for multi-server systems, this comes up in many communities. So it's very popular in the theoretical computer, the theoretical computer science community, which you're all a part of, um, to do this, to do this kind of work. But it's also popular in my community, the stochastic queuing community. Okay, so these kinds of problems come up there too. And I'm going to talk about both communities. But within the Sigmetrics community, I'm going to talk about two papers that we wrote recently. And both of them deal with multi-server systems and how to optimize scheduling. Both of them won awards. So um, let's talk about optimal scheduling again. It comes in two flavors. So in the theoretical computer science community, we're usually talking about the adversarial model. So the idea is there's this big bad adversary and the adversary is trying to mess up your scheduling policy. So the adversary is giving you really bad job sizes and really bad arrival times in an effort to make it hard for you to schedule, all right? Um, and, um, and lots of things are proven in this model. Okay, by contrast, the stochastic setting is very different and more realistic in some ways. So the job sizes are now drawn from some real world distribution and the arrival times are drawn from some real world distribution. It's very typical in the stochastic setting to say the job sizes are drawn IID from some general distribution, okay? And then to prove things for any general distribution. So we're gonna concentrate over here but talk also contrast with the worst case. All right, so outline. So I'm gonna start by talking about just a single server queue. And I'm just gonna talk about what scheduling looks like there because let's start simple. Okay, so just one queue. And then afterwards, we're gonna move into scheduling for multi-server systems. But what you'll notice about this multi-server systems is there's one shared queue and there are a bunch of servers. And then we'll move into scheduling with dispatching systems. And this is also a multi-server system, but you'll notice there's no shared queue. The queues are at the servers and there's just a fronted load balancer. So this is gonna be the organization of the talk that's gonna go with these papers. So we're gonna start really simple, single server. All right, so here's a single server queue. And there are jobs that arrive over time into the queue and then they're served at that big circle, which is the server. So you see these jobs arriving over time. And what you'll notice is as the jobs are arriving, this job over here is being served. It's getting work done on it, okay? And so we say that this orange part over here is the attained service or age. It's how much has been done so far. And this green part over here is the remaining size. That's what's left to do. And these jobs have all of it left to do, okay? So now within this context, we might have a scheduling policy and the scheduling policy might switch what it's doing. And then we might have some more attained service on this job at service. So at any moment in time, every job might have some amount that's attained service and some amount that's remaining size, okay? It might be all remaining size. And we'll be interested in something I call response time, T. So this is like the little bit of notation you're gonna see. You're gonna see this thing T which is the time from when a job arrives until it completes, okay? So just how long it took you in the line plus being served. Um, so now, as I said, we're gonna look at this whole queue in a stochastic setting. And the stochastic setting is called the MG1 model. So let me explain what those things mean. So first the M means that the arrival process is a Poisson process. So jobs are coming in at a constant rate at any point in time, there's a constant rate of lambda jobs per second coming in, okay? I can go into more detail if you wanna know, but the basically Poisson process at any moment in time, there's some constant rate lambda jobs per second coming in. The job sizes are coming from a general distribution. That's what G means. 
So you can imagine you have some probability distribution and X is a random variable and X is gonna denote the job size. And this can be anything. This can be any job size distribution, okay? And so you can see that the job sizes are just picked randomly from this distribution, IID from this distribution. Some are big, some are small. And at any moment in time, as I said, jobs are partially done. This is the attained service and there's remaining size. And everything can be preempted and the preemption is free. You can start and stop and go back and forth. Okay, one last piece of notation. This is the last one, load. So load refers to the average fraction of time that the server is busy, okay? How, what fraction of time is it busy? And so load has a simple formula. So we call it rho, and it's the arrival rate times the mean job size. So let me just explain. Suppose three jobs per second are coming into the system, and suppose each job on average takes a quarter of a second. So three are coming in per second, and each requires a quarter of a second. Then we say that the server is busy three quarters of the time, okay? And this obviously has to be less than one. You have to make sure load is less than one, okay? So things don't explode. All right, so that's it. This is the notation you need. Everybody got it? Row T, you got T, you got row. This is job size X. All right, so the only real question for a single server system is how are we going to optimize mean response time? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna schedule? So here you have a queue and you have your jobs that are partially worked on. And I'm sure somebody can answer for me how we should schedule these jobs so as to minimize mean response time. What should we do? Which job should we work on first? Shortest remaining, okay? So you wanna order your jobs based on the green part and you see I've already ordered them that way. Thank you, okay? And you wanna work on the job with the littlest green part first. You wanna do shortest remaining processing time, okay? So that's the correct answer, okay? And this is also what we naturally do. Like we naturally gravitate this way. You know, when you have a lot of things on your desk and you have all these things to do, you pick whatever I can get rid of most quickly and take care of that, okay? So look, you're doing the right thing, okay? It's a good thing to do, SRPT, okay? And this SRPT is actually optimal in a very strong sense. It's optimal in the worst case sense. Do you still have a question or was that the question? No, 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 no. Oh, go ahead, is yes. So I'm imagining that there's a stream of jobs coming in. There's an arrival sequence, but, but SRPT is optimal in, in, a, in a worst case arrival, any, any arrival sequence you want, which are arrival times and job sizes, okay? All right, and you don't get to see them ahead of time and you still wanna do SRPT. Okay, so it's optimal in a worst case sense, very, very strong, okay? And the first analysis of, of um, it in an MG1 setting was done not all that long ago, okay? So I know it seems long ago to you guys, but it's not that long ago, okay, that people first analyzed SRPT in an MG1 setting, okay? So SRPT is the right thing to do, and you might be wondering, well, okay, does it really matter that much to do something like SRPT as opposed to like first come first serve? And so I decided to bring a few graphs to show you. So what you see here in the middle is something called the squared coefficient of variation. And this is the squared coefficient of variation of the job size distribution. So X is the job size distribution, and I'm looking at the variance of X, and I'm normalizing it by the mean squared. So the point that I'm gonna to try to make is that when the job size distribution is not highly variable, when C squared is small, scheduling doesn't matter so much. And when C squared is big, scheduling matters a lot more. So here's a picture where C squared is small. Okay, there isn't that much variability. And you see mean response time is a function of load. And you see that yes, SRPT is better than first come first serve and the difference grows as load grows, but they're not that far apart. When you have more variability in your job size distribution, um, yes? Uh, question from uh, Ibar, look. Yes. Worst case being an MG1, worst case with respect to the distribution. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I haven't defined yet what optimality means in an MG1. I've only talked about worst case optimality so far, okay? Um, with respect to optimality, we're gonna see examples of, of what we're trying to get at. With, but certainly if you're worst case optimal, 
then you're optimal in an MG1 setting as well. Okay, it's, it's you're doing the best you can do for any arrival sequence. Okay, so worst case optimal is still optimal. Okay, but but we're going to see examples where we don't know what's worst case optimal, and we're still going to try to get to optimal. Okay, for an MG1. So anyway, this is low variability, and you see they're close. High variability, you see that there's a much bigger difference, and that's because when you have high variability, you have what? You have What's going on here? Why is there a difference? Yes? Big jobs, small jobs. big jobs and small jobs. Small jobs getting stuck behind big jobs. Problematic, OK? You don't want to do that, OK? So all right, so that's it. So we, we did a single server queue. We saw you should do SRPT. It was all good, OK? And we saw that it makes a big difference. Moving on, multi-server. So now we're going to have a multi-server queue. And we're going to ask ourselves, what should we do? So here's a multi-server queue. OK, and we can decide now, now they're K servers, and we can decide at any moment in time which K jobs should be running. OK, if there are fewer than K jobs, then fewer than K jobs are running. But we can pick the K jobs to run at every moment in time, and we can do it preemptively. And so we ask ourselves, how do we want to pick those K jobs to run? How should we schedule to minimize mean response time? What should we do? OK. so. An idea is, and this is going towards optimality, okay? An idea is we'd love to be able to match the single powerful, a single powerful scheduler with optimal, a single powerful server with optimal scheduling. We'd love to be able to match that. Why? Because if we had a single server like this that was k times more powerful than these, so these say are running at speed one over K, and this is running at speed one, okay? If we had this one single ultra fast server, it could mimic everything that's going on on this side, okay? Your single server could mimic everything that was going on on this side, and so certainly it's at least as good. So it serves as a lower bound, okay? So it would be great if we could match that lower bound, okay? But what is the optimal scheduling for a single server? SRPT, thank goodness, okay, SRPT. So we're trying to make our multi-server system look like a single server with SRPT. So what do you think we should do? We should, at every moment in time, K jobs with shortest remaining processing time, right? That seems like a very good idea, okay? So I'm gonna call that SRPT K. This is not a minus sign. This is just <laughs> PowerPoint, okay? So. So this is SRPTK, and at every moment in time, you can see I'm choosing to run those jobs with the smallest green parts, okay? Smallest remaining time. And this sounds like a very, very good idea, okay? Just like your desk again, but now there's K of you, and you're all doing the K smallest remaining time, right? Very nice, okay? So unfortunately, this SRPTK that I just said was so nice doesn't seem to behave very well in a worst case setting. It was fantastic for a single server, but once we move to multiple servers, that adversary can really mess with us. So there's a theorem by Leonardi and Ross from 1997. It was um, updated, I think in 2007, they wrote a, a, another paper on it in case you search for this, okay? And it says the competitive ratio of SRPTK is bad. Okay, what do I mean by bad? Well, we have the minimum here of two terms. This first term, this n here, is the total number of arrivals. So if you have some stream that's like infinitely long with stuff coming in, you know, n is getting very big, okay? The second term over here is a ratio between the biggest job size and the smallest job size. And if you're somebody like me who works with job size distributions, you know that they can differ by many, many orders of magnitude, the biggest job and the smallest job. So that's not so good either, okay? And so we have this bad competitive ratio. Um, can anybody kind of picture a little bit about why, why things can go bad with SRPTK? Like, why is SRPTK bad? It seems very good, right? At all times, you run the, the shortest jobs, yes? Uh, maybe you have all these short jobs running, but then a big one gets stuck behind it, and you be working on that. Yeah, so it's all a packing issue. It's all about how you pack, okay? And so you can create bad packing scenarios. 
okay, where you're not really like you ideally want to take that big job and run it opposite a bunch of smalls that came one after another. Okay. So anyway, so it's a bad thing, okay? But no other policy does better. So this is what the theory community likes to do, right? You prove that something maybe has some kind of bad competitive ratio, but then you say, but this is the best, okay? And then the problem is closed, okay? <laughs> There's nothing else to say, right? No other policy does better, we're closed and we all go home, okay? Everybody's happy, all right. But there's something frustrating about this. Because again, if I'm doing a simulation or something, I know SRPTK is the way I want to run the system. So should I be able to prove something about it? Okay, seems like I should. All right, so turns out you can, and this is going to be one of our big theorems here, is that stochastic, in the stochastic setting, in the MGK setting, SRPTK is heavy traffic optimal. So I'm going to explain all those words, yes. Mark, yes. Um, we should have optimal SRPTK plus one, right? How do we do that in the Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, let's see. When K is one, uh, yeah, it is. It is opt. Um, maybe this is an upper bound. Yeah, good. It's a log bridge. Okay. Uh, so the whole thing. There is a log, oh, log base K, log base K. Good, excellent, excellent. Are you sure? Well, I'm not, no. the counterexample only works when K is at least two. Yeah, the counterexample is definitely for K is two. The counterexample they show in the paper, they have like two servers and they do exactly what you said about the packing, where they have the, the long job should be packed against short. Okay, moving on. Um, okay, so stochastic SRPT is, he is heavy traffic optimal. Okay, so here's our MGK. Here's our MGK system with these K servers. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to say that the MGK system over here with K servers looks very much like this server that's running at K times the speed. Okay. So these are all running at speed one over K. This is running like at speed one. Okay. So we're trying to say that this looks like this. That's our hope. Okay. And if we can say that it looks like this, because that's our lower bound then where we must be optimal, okay? That's, this is a lower bound, remember, on any K server system, on any of these, S, and any of these MGKs. All right, so the theorem is gonna say the mean response time, remember T is response time, mean response time under SRPTK divided by the mean response time under SRPT1 goes to one, okay, as the load goes to one. Okay, so, so we're talking about load goes to one here, okay? And what, what we're saying is SRPTK is optimal when the load is high, as the load gets higher, okay? Now, you might be a little bit worried, well, okay, but what if the load isn't high, okay? Usually when things are very good, when the load is high, they're also very close to optimal when the load is low, okay? Um, that's not something that we're proving, that's open, <laughs> okay? But, um, but, but when the load is high, it's very good. And that's a very, very good indicator because curves tend to go up like this. And if things are good when the load is high and they're tight, like tight to optimal, then they tend to be very good at lower load as well. Okay, yes, Magdalene. Um, I have a question. So is this theorem, um, does it only apply when the case servers are identical or does it also apply, let's say, one is processing blocks and faster than Ah, uh, so we proved it for case servers that are identical. Um, I have to think. Oh, Isaac has a comment. Uh, it, it applies as long as all the speeds are uh, complicated. So it does, but and the truth, the proof is not. Okay. All right. Okay. Moving on. So, um, so okay. So this is a good indicator. So I would like to actually, because it's a theory lunch, I'd like to go a little bit into the proof of why in the world this is happening, okay? So you might, um, okay, maybe it's helpful to just draw the, some pictures. Actually, let's go back for a second. You might already have a little bit of a sense in your head. Like I like when I sit and listen to talks to try to think ahead at like what is going on here, okay? So the load is high, so lots of stuff is happening, okay? Lots of stuff is coming in. So these servers are like being kept busy, okay? So they are like, you know, they're all slow, but there's K of them, okay? And they're like doing work. So it kind of maybe feels like they're kind of behaving like a single server, okay? It's not obvious that they're behaving like a single server because the single server 
is really good at getting rid of the things that have the shortest remaining processing time, okay? And, and it gets rid of them very fast. While here, each of these servers is running kind of slowly, so it's like not so good at rushing to get rid of those small remaining times. But in theory, you know, maybe, maybe it happens that they're similar, okay? So, okay, so now let's try to do a little proof sketch, okay? So imagine that you're a job of size X, okay? So your job, your size is X, and you walk into the system, okay? So your, your job size X, and we want to understand your response time. We want to understand how long it's going to take you. So you are bothered by all the jobs whose remaining size is less than yours. Those are the only ones that are relevant to you, okay? They're the only ones that matter, the ones that are less than you. Okay, let's look over here. Again, you're a job of size X, and the only jobs that can influence you are the ones in the yellow bubble, okay? So, so I, again here, these are the slow servers, speed one over K, this is the fast server, and only these in the yellow bubble are the jobs that can influence you, okay? The relevant work, yes? On the right, can the server be doing multiple jobs at a time? No, one job at a time. Every server only does one job at a time. Okay, now what I'd like to show is that the relevant work relevant to the Java size X, okay? The, the total amount of work that the Java size X has to fight to you know, get done, okay? Is very similar in this system and in this system, okay? But it's not obvious that they're gonna have similar work, okay? So I'm going to try to look at the difference, this delta, the difference in the relevant work in the SRPTK system and the relevant work in the SRPT1 system. Now, okay, which of these is smaller? Which, which will always have the smaller relevant work, smaller or equal to? Who, who's better at getting rid of jobs that, that have remaining size less than X? SRPT, okay, uh, sorry, SRPT1, okay? This SRPT1 system is clearly better with a single server, right? Because it's running the super fast server. So the only question really is, does the SRPTK system kind of catch up to the super fantastic SRPT1. It's like doing its thing and, and flushing that work out as quickly as possible, okay? So now, well, it really matters how many jobs are currently in the system, okay? Specifically, how many jobs that are relevant to us are currently in the system. Because if there are only like, say, two jobs in the system that are relevant, like two of these little green things in this bubble, then this system isn't working as well as that system. Right? But if there are a lot of jobs in here, then maybe this system could be working as fast as that system. Okay? So let's divide time into intervals. Few jobs, many jobs, few jobs, many jobs. And we're going to assume during these few jobs, we have fewer than K relevant jobs. So I'm counting how many relevant jobs there are in SRBTK. And then, and so that's the few jobs and many jobs, it's more than K relevant jobs. Okay, greater than or equal to K relevant jobs, okay? Now, suppose I have, remember what I'm trying to do is look at this work, this difference in work, this delta. Suppose I know that there are fewer than K relevant jobs in SRPTK, okay? All right, how big can the difference be between these two systems in terms of relevant work? Okay, how big can it be? Well. This difference is only at most those jobs each with X, okay? Because they're each at most a size X because I'm looking at things that are relevant to X, so there's something smaller than X. So in terms of the, the relevant work that they contribute, it's whatever the number of them is here times X at most, okay? So at most it's K times X. Okay, maybe K minus one times X. Okay, I'm not gonna worry about that, all right? Okay, that's at most, okay? Now, when we have many jobs, then the SRPTK system is like is, is doing relevant work at, at, at the same speed as the other system. So that's kind of the catch-up phase, okay? And because we can divide time like this, we can say that the difference is never more than this Kx, okay? This difference in relevant work. Now, when the difference in relevant work is not that high, then you can start to say, well, maybe the difference in response time is not that high, okay? All right. So 
as I said, the difference in relevant work is not that high. We next translate this into a bound on the difference in response time. So this is mean response time under SRPTK. This is mean response time under SRPT1. And then there's something else. Okay, so this theorem is the first bound. This is the first analysis of SRPTK in an MGK setting, okay? This is the first analysis. And what we see is there's this, that SRPTK looks like SRPT1, but there's some extra, okay? And what we prove is that this extra, using a different result in the literature, we prove that this extra really behaves like little o of the mean response time in SRPT1 when load is high, okay? When load is high, okay, it becomes little o. And because it becomes a little low, when you look at the ratio, when load is high, this goes to one, which is the theorem that we were hoping to prove. Okay, so people might be a little concerned, well, what about when load is low? When load is low, okay, this is not little O of SRPT1, okay? And in fact, this difference can be significant when load is low as it should be, because when load is low, we are in no way trying to say that the SRPTK system is like an SRPT1 system, right? Like imagine there's only one job, okay? So it should take K times as long in the SRPTK system as the SRPT1 system, right? That would be, right? Okay, so, so um, I, can, I can break this up for you if you wanna see that. Does anybody wanna see what happens when load is low? No, okay, all right, so, okay. So it's just, you're trusting me, okay. So, all right, so what we've done is we looked at our first multi-server system, okay? And we saw that the same lesson that we learned up top, like that you should do SRPT, also works for the multi-server system. You should do SRPTK, okay? And, and I really believe that this is the right policy to use for a multi-server system. Like if you know job sizes, this is what you should do. Yes, we only proved it you know, in heavy traffic that it's optimal, but I really believe this is, this is right in general, okay? In a stochastic setting, not worst case. All right, so now let's move to a harder model. So I say this is harder because we need to make our decision up front. We need to like send the job somewhere. We don't get to hold on to everything in a queue, okay? We need to make a decision and send it somewhere. And this kind of model really comes up in practice all the time. So I do a lot of work with different companies and this is the typical model that we deal with. The job comes in, you don't just hold it there, okay? You send it off somewhere and you know it might be sent to one queue or to a different queue or whatever and you need to make this decision about how you're gonna send it off. And there's actually, um, okay, now of course you wanna minimize response time of some sort, okay, some new response time. So there are actually two decisions that need to be made. One is the dispatching policy. Okay, how are you gonna dispatch? Can anybody tell me what the second question is? What other thing is still on the table? Yes. Like for a particular server, which job is to Yeah, like, you know, which scheduling policy should we use at a given server, right? I mean, there's two questions now. Excellent. So, so I'm wondering what kind of scheduling policy should I use at a server? But I think you can answer that. Like a server, it's just a stream of jobs coming into the server, right? So you already know the answer to that, right? That's SRVT. Okay, so now we're trying to do dispatching. So we're trying to minimize mean response time and we're trying to find the right dispatching policy when you have SRPT at the servers, okay? So we're just asking ourselves, how should we dispatch, okay? Like, you know, do we want to send to a random queue? Like, what do we want to do? All right, so it's not even obvious that we're going to be able to do anything optimal okay, or like near any lower bound, okay, because this is a much harder setting, okay? It's much trickier when you have to already send the stuff out there. So, so I think when we're starting to work on this thing, you know, it just was not entirely obvious, like, is this going to work as well, okay? Because it's a harder setting. Okay, so here's SRPT at the servers. We need a dispatching policy, and maybe we can take some suggestions, okay? So what, what's like the simplest dispatching policy you can think of? Least work, like least, like 
Okay, good. Okay, uh, it's my second one. Okay, so my second one is the green one. It's greedy. Excellent. And it says, let's dispatch every job to the queue with the least work. Okay, this is like a very nice load balancing kind of policy because you're equalizing the work everywhere. Okay, um, the first one is random. Um, you know, when I first gave a talk on dispatching, that was the first thing that people suggested in the audience. Um, and, you know, is like, why don't you just send them randomly, flip a coin? And that's certainly another way to do it. Okay, you can randomly flip a coin. All right. Anybody have any clues to which is better? <laughs> Go ahead. Yes? Random? Random? <laughs> no, nobody agrees. Okay. So, so it turns out random is better. Okay. <laughs> you should listen to your theory organizers. They know everything. Okay. So random is actually better. Okay. And so, huh, that's kind of weird. Okay. Mean response is a function of load. Why is random better? Okay. So can anybody explain that one to me? So let's try to maybe think about it from Okay, so this is why is least work left so much worse? That's another way of asking your question. Okay, why is it so bad? I think a small job to a huge, very large job would make it very difficult. Aha, aha, exactly, exactly. So, so let me break that down a little bit. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to make this system mimic a single, a single server queue with a big fat server. Okay, you want it to look like that. And that big fat server is really good. We've said the optimal thing to do is get those short jobs out. Get them out, get them out, get them out, okay? Here, you'd like to get the short jobs out. So you would ideally like to send the jobs somewhere so that they all get out. But if you do something like least work left, exactly what you said, a big job could come and block this up, okay? And now no other jobs come to the server, and then we don't have little jobs at every server. Okay, random is not necessarily the best thing either. Okay, but at least it randomly just sends jobs everywhere. And so hopefully some small jobs get somewhere. Okay, so very weird, but, but random could be better. Okay, so we somehow want to spread the small jobs out. Now you are probably thinking in your head right now, okay, I want to spread the small jobs out. I'm sure I could come up with a policy that does that, right? Like a policy called spread out the small jobs, right? Like figure out who's small and spread them out to like divide them up among the servers, okay? So if you're thinking that, that's good. Keep thinking that, that's great. Okay, so now I'm gonna introduce what we came up with. It's called guardrails, okay? And all that intuition is right. So here's all these different jobs, different sizes, and I'm gonna group them into different ranks, which is what you're probably already thinking, you know, like smalls, mediums, larges, and you're probably already thinking, I wanna take the smalls and somehow spread them out. Okay, maybe even I wanna spread out the mediums, you know, why not? Okay, <laughs> like just in case I run out of smalls, it sounds good. Okay, so the guardrails solution is actually a little bit different than that. It's mostly that idea, okay? But it's a little different because what we're doing in guardrails is we're taking any existing dispatching policy, P, and then we're just sticking some kind of guardrails on it to make sure it doesn't behave badly. And we're showing that this new policy is gonna be somehow fantastic. Okay, so let me draw a picture. We start with any dispatching policy, P. Like pick your favorite, random, least work left, whatever you pick your policy, okay? What I'm gonna do is put some guardrails on the road Okay, you know what guardrails are, right? So you don't, don't, don't go a little too much to the right and don't go a little too much to the left, okay? The guardrails are basically keeping you, keeping things balanced, okay? And then it becomes a policy GP, which is like a guarded version of P, okay? So basically what GP is, guarded P, is basically P, but I'm ensuring that somehow the jobs in each rank are essentially balanced, okay? So, so just to be very, very clear, okay? Suppose I wanna look at the G version of RAND, okay? So RAND is gonna send to a random server, okay? So I still let RAND send to a random server. RAND picks a random server, but you have to pick a random server in the set of eligible servers, okay? 
if a server, like if the job is small that you're randomly dispatching, okay, and this server has already gotten a whole bunch of smalls, and it's like way unbalanced compared to other servers, like it has way more smalls than some other servers, it's no longer in the eligible set. And I'm only sending to the eligible set of servers that, that haven't received too many of the smalls, okay? The same for like if your job is a medium, okay? So I'm basically letting you do what you want. You can do RAND among an eligible set. You can do least work left among an eligible set, okay? And the eligible set is changing over time, okay? So, all right, so that's the basic idea. I don't really wanna go into 100 more details because I don't think it's helpful, but you wanna keep this idea in mind, okay? So there's one more question, okay? And that is, what is going on with these ranks? Okay, this is a big question. So, so formally, we're gonna define the rank of a job is take its size and then log base C, okay? I haven't said what C is yet, but I'm gonna take log base C, like you can imagine log base two or something, and it splits things like this, okay? You can imagine log base 10, okay? And it splits things into bigger things, okay? Bigger, bigger pieces, okay? So, so there's this question of what is C? Now, you might think it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, we're theorists, log base something, it's all like the same thing, okay? But it turns out it matters hugely, okay? This ends up being very critical, okay? Doesn't seem like it should. So let me give you some intuition. If C is too large, okay, if C is too large, then basically small jobs and big jobs are all in one group, okay? And we have not differentiated small jobs from big jobs, which is problematic, okay? Because the whole idea was to give bias to small jobs and get the small jobs out there, okay? So we don't want C to be too large. On the other hand, if C is too small, then you don't have enough jobs in each rank to be able to do good load balancing among the number of jobs, okay? And so this becomes problematic. You don't want C to be too small. So one of the big insights of this paper was figuring out what does C really need to be to make that multi-server system look like a single server system? And it turns out C needs to be this formula, okay? So this is a formula. The key point here is that it depends on load, okay? It depends on row, okay? Which I said it should depend on load, okay? So if load is high, if load is high, so there's tons and tons of jobs always available, what direction should C go? Should it go big or small? If load is high, remember the two things I have to worry about. When there are lots and lots of jobs, what should I do with C? Small, okay? And then when there are few jobs, C can be high, okay? And so, so this thing actually converges to a C of one when load is high, okay? Which as it should, okay? So this ends up being very important and I'll show you in a minute why, okay? So given all this, we have this guardrails and now we can prove the nice theorem. So we take any guarded policy and we have the lower bound, which is a single server of K times the speed. And we have a nice theorem that says for any dispatching policy P, the limit as the load goes to one of the mean response time in the guarded policy divided by the mean response time of the rest of PT1 is one. So they become the same. Okay, so guarded P is heavy traffic optimal. So there's two things that I want you to see here, okay? The first is, again, we've proven this when load goes to one, okay? Again, that's a very good indicator that probably guarded P is pretty good when load is small too, okay? But that's not, we haven't proven that, okay? but it's a very good indicator. I mean, where, how can the curves go, okay? The other thing that I think is really important here is that the choice of dispatching policy doesn't matter at all. So I am somebody who's been working on dispatching policies the whole like 22 years I've been a professor here. So I've been here a professor 22 years. I think when I came to CMU and I gave my job talk, it was a talk about dispatching policies. And I asked the audience a question like, you know, what, what dispatching policy should you use? And, you know, somebody answered and it was all really great. And that's how I got a job, okay, off of a dispatching policy. 
So I really believe dispatching policies are important. But according to this theorem, okay, the dispatching policy doesn't matter so long as you guard it, okay, in SRPT system, in SR, with SRPT servers. Yes. Um, it's not so how quickly it converges to one. So, so the proof is really for this. Um, it's it's the same kind of proof as before. Like we're saying, the mean response time in this system is the mean response time of that system plus some additive term, and that term it it, it depends on it. It no. It ah. Uh, does it depend on it? I don't think. It's on a kind of yeah, it's. So basically, it, how aggressively the guardrails take over. Yeah, it's how well we're guarding, but it's not the policy itself. The policy really doesn't matter. Okay, so now I'm going to show you a picture. Okay, so remember this surprising result: Rand was better than least work left. Here's guarded Rand. It's better. Here's guard least work left. Okay, at least least work left was better. Okay, <laughs> so you could be happy. Okay, guarded least work left was better than guarded rand. Okay, tiny, but basically they're the same. Basically, these things are heavy traffic optimal. Okay, they're they're hitting they're hitting your single server. Okay, and they're very very different policies. Okay, but they're all heavy traffic optimal. And once they're optimal here, there's just not much wiggle room <laughs> down here. Okay. All right. So what I think is interesting to do is to take one step back now and ask what would happen in the worst case scenario? Because you all love approximation algorithms and you're probably all thinking, okay, you know, this is all very nice here, but what if I had an arrival sequence where the adversary takes control, okay? Um, you know, what should I do there? Okay, so it turns out somebody already beat you to it. Okay, Avrahami and Azar, 2003, um, wrote this really nice paper, okay, that said, we're going to study this system, okay, and with SRPT at the queues, okay, and they came up with a policy called IMD. IMD stands for immediate dispatch, okay, it's nothing, <laughs> doesn't mean anything, but they came up with their policy, IMD, that is supposed to immediately dispatch to these things. And they said, we're going to try to get the best policy we can. And so their policy IMD is actually pretty similar to guardrails, OK? Um, on the, on the, one difference is it's a single policy. It's a single policy that basically tries to balance rank or work, OK? So, but it's just a single policy trying to balance it. It's not trying to correct from any general policy. Eh, it's a small difference, OK? Um, there are a few other differences I'm not going to go into. But I do want to get to this point, OK? The real key difference, the really important difference, is they use a fixed base for their logarithm. When they're defining the rank, OK? Remember I said it's a log base C of x? They're using a fixed base, OK, a fixed C. And we said that is problematic, OK, because C is super important. So in this setting, they prove the same kind of competitive ratio, okay? So it's the same kind of bad packing problems, you know, things are not working in the right way. And so they have the same kind of competitive ratio and, and believe it or not, again, same thing, like nobody can do any better, problem is closed, it's over, okay? But we decided nevertheless, maybe you could take their algorithm and we could just like simulate it and see how it does in a stochastic setting. Unfortunately, not so good, okay? So the problem is that IMD really doesn't translate to the stochastic setting because in the stochastic setting, you really need to take load into account. If load is high, you want C to be much smaller, okay? And you need that to be able to separate out the small jobs. And so you're not gonna get this kind of performance by hitting C of two. So just not gonna, it's not gonna work out for you. All right, so I'm ready to conclude. Okay, so, I think that this talk can be viewed as one of these going beyond the worst case. Um, you've probably heard a lot of talks on like going beyond the worst case. Many of the talks that I hear on going beyond the worst case is like, well, I still have a worst case adversary, 
but now I'm going to allow people to like mix things up or something like mix up the inputs or something or, you know, but, but there's still always kind of this worst case adversary sending stuff in. And maybe you have some like power to, to mess with the adversary a little bit. This is not that talk. Okay. There is no worst case adversary. We started out with a goal of optimal scheduling and multi-server systems. We consider two different multi-server systems, two different kind of setups. In both cases, the worst case adversarial model did not work for us, okay? We just can't get near optimal. I mean, it works in the sense that, you know, these algorithms are as good as you can do, but they're not near optimal. In both cases, we considered stochastic results. So here we found that SRPTK was heavy traffic optimal. And here we found that you can take any policy and map it to a guarded version of the policy and it will be heavy traffic optimal. So anything will work. Um, if you have questions, you should see me. And um, thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Yes? Going back to the backlog on C, is there like a good test why C doesn't depend on the variance of the job size distribution? Oh, why C doesn't depend on the variance of the job size distribution. So SRPT actually does better when you have higher variance jobs. Um, so it's kind of going the other direction from what you're thinking. SRPT is like the right thing to do. I guess like what I was thinking was like if all the job sizes were the same, it's just mm -hmm. kind of what is. If all the job sizes were the same, then I don't know that guarded P could help you um, anymore. So yeah. Exactly. Anybody else? Yes. Is it reasonable to know Bro and not be able to set C? How can someone implement a Bro policy? Ah, interesting. Okay, so um, so that's an that's very relevant. Um, so so people can monitor Bro. So you can remember what you're really monitoring is like fraction of time that a server is busy. Okay. Um, but it could change over time. Workloads do change over time, like the arrival rate does change over time. If things change over time, um, you might have to modify your C. Um, uh, probably if I had to do it in practice, I would pick some ranges and I would pick the right C for different load ranges so that I didn't have to do it too frequently, just off the top of my head. Also just to add on to that, yeah. like, it's important to notice there is a log of one over one minus one in C, which for real workloads is typically not beyond like 99.9% .9 load. There's sort of a limit on how crazy C can get. Yeah, if you, if you look at that function, it's really varying between two and one. Uh, I didn't go into all those details, but if you look at this function, it's not uh, wherever it went. It's not that diff. Oh, did I pass it? Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. But anyway, if you looked at that function, um, it doesn't change that much. It's, it's between two and one, but still it makes a difference. You don't want it to be a two when it's not a two. Uh, and, and the function kind of goes down like that. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, so like implementing like guardrails, right. And some, in some sense it's like harder than just doing the normal policy, but it takes time and you have to like store stuff. Are, are you ever worried about the, like the longer like memory or one time, like the problem that it takes too long to do the server. I guess this is sort of a different problem. Than yeah. Um, are are you worried about um, right. are you worried about the model in general as compared as compared to a single a, a central queue right. model? So distributor, if you're getting things online, it matters like how quickly the distributor sends it to a server. Right. That any... normally is not the big concern. So right. so these are these are super high speed routers that are used here to very, very quickly dispatch. That's not the concern. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Um, like, the slide with all of the compare all of the graphs? When I compare all yeah. of the plots. Yeah. Uh, back. Sorry. These things? Uh, no, the one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is this it? Yeah. Okay. So um, I think. I, so, I, if I remember correctly, the theorem 
was essentially that the a guarded policy, if you have a guarded policy, then the policy doesn't matter, right? The policy doesn't matter. Yeah, it's any guarded policy. Okay. Any guarded policy has so, this behavior. How, how, why is the guarded lease work left perform better than the guarded random policy? They're they're really the same here when row is one. Okay, that doesn't mean they're the same at the other loads. But yeah, as row goes to one, they're the same. Yeah, that's what's proven. Yes, um, Edward. Uh, so, so Isaac ran a whole bunch of different simulations. I mean, it should be between two and one. And I think, I think the problem is that it started to become pretty bad when we, when we limited it to, like when we tried to make it like IMD, um, it was not a great policy at all. So I, I don't have a graph showing it on here, but it was back up in this range up here. Basically, if your C is so small that like none of your buffers have traced off them, you'll do terribly. And if you see it's so big that like a large fraction of all of your jobs are in the same bucket, you'll also do terribly. But anything between that is really, really fine. Yes, Peter. There's a policy that the other pilots did and they tried to figure out the policy and that's what I I think, yeah, we have played with that. Um, one of the worst policies is Called SIDA, which is funny because in other settings it's one of the best policies. Yeah. And you can see in our paper, it'll get like a response time of 600 if you don't guard it, and then like it'll be 50 just like all the other policies. Like yeah. So SIDA is a policy that separates small jobs from big jobs, and it's fantastic when you have first come first serve queues, but here you really don't want to separate small jobs from big jobs. So, yeah. Yes? But SIDA on this graph, it's just going to be like a flat line. So if you put CIDA, it's going to be a disaster up here, okay? It's going to be like this, like going straight up, okay? But if you look at it here in the guarded version, it will be right with it. It will be guarded. It'll, it'll be just like these. Yeah, because big row dominates small row. All curves kind of go like this. So this is the point that I was making. When you prove something in heavy traffic, um, people... When I first heard about this proving things in heavy traffic, I was like, yeah, but that's just in heavy traffic. What about the rest? But because of the way curves go, um, there just isn't that much wiggle room. It's not like under lighter traffic, like it's not like CIDA would hit here and then under lighter traffic it'd go boing, boing, you know, or something like that. It's not gonna do that. So that, that really dominates everything. Yes, yes. Um, so is it known that like bucketizing the ranks in a logarithmic way is optimal? Like we, because you answered the question about what uh, the right base is. But. Yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe maybe there are other ways to do it, but I mean, but we're showing that this meets optimality. I, yeah, I feel like people are um, really into this uh, guarded kind of thing. Uh, any other questions on anything else? Like, let, let me go back to the conclusion slide so you can at least look at that. Okay, yes. Assuming all the servers run SRCP, is there some other way of doing the like the server that's doing different? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so, um, so we were trying to reach optimality. So, and remember how I had two questions? And so the, the question of how you want to handle the servers to be able to reach optimality is going to be to stick to SRPT. Um, in practice, usually servers are running things like first come first serve. And if they're running first come first serve, um, you're not gonna do as well as this, okay? Not, not, not nearly as well as this, but you can, when the servers are running first come first serve, you can still kill a lot of that variance. So the variance was the problem. It was small jobs getting stuck behind big jobs. And when things are running first come first serve, you can still get around that variance problem of small jobs getting stuck behind big jobs by separating them out by sending small jobs to one place and large jobs to another. Okay, um, yeah, uh, yeah. You can also have queues like this, like a central queue will end up doing pretty well if you're stuck with first compressor. Not as well as SRBTK, of course. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Ryan. Uh, it was pretty, it was pretty like 
the size of the set S of eligible servers was not small. Like, um, I, so, okay, so I didn't go into like exactly how the whole algorithm works, but basically you're trying to keep a distance between servers in terms of how much of the relevant work was dispatched to each server. Um, and you're trying to maintain that that distance isn't too high. And um, typically most of the servers are still available to you. You just, you don't want them to get too lopsided. Go for it. One piece of flexibility we've talked about here, but this is a paper, is that you can have, a, you can choose different widths of the guardrails. So, like how close the mm -hmm. shortest server and longest server have to be to each other. And if you choose a larger width, then a larger fraction become three choices. Um, and then it starts depending on what your underlying policy is, whether it itself is doing some like good decisions or something like SIDA. Right. The paper has a lot more details on that. I presented one version of it, <laughs> the guardrails, guardrails parameter one. I didn't go into all of that. Yeah, there are there are more parameters. There's also like what you do when servers are idle. I just I wanted to keep the talk pretty clear. Anything else? Yes, Magdalene. So are you doing that for every job, like even a large job, you would send it to the queue where it would get served first? Is that what you have in mind? Yeah. So just kind of greedily for every job, where is it going to get served first? Um, uh, that's not, yeah. Um, so, so here's the problem, okay? So say I send a large job to some server and things are looking good for it, okay? But now a bunch of small jobs come and they're all like, hey, you know, this is a cool server for me to go to because even though it has this big, large job, I can like come and stuff myself in and I'm oblivious to that large job so I can get served really quickly, okay? And so now you have small jobs that are jumping ahead of that large job and that large job is not really seeing what you intended for it to see. What the guardrails policy does is it ensures that the dispatched work in each rank class is kept equal so that that large job isn't interfered with too much by future small jobs. Yeah, that, all that's key to proving this. Okay, I think I've kept you here long enough. Um, so it's uh, it's been an hour. Um, if anybody has any further questions, just hang out, okay? But um, I don't wanna make everybody hang out if, you know, if you've got other things to do. Thank you.